we are uh, this year in 2020 we are celebrating uh, 10 years to the uh, global uh, to the entrepreneurship on tap um, program and actually we had a uh, younger brother born this year which is a cafe entrepreneurship every day at 10 o'clock in the morning you're invited to join each and every one of those and thank you for being here uh, we decided to hold uh, a few lectures in English to uh, allow participants from all over the world. And um, I'd like to say a few uh, words of introduction about our guest tonight. And this is the uh, Elite Geller, a repeat entrepreneur in fintech, um, a very new domain with not many female entrepreneurs. Currently with the uh, Capitolis. Uh, Elite had an exit with Fariana, her first uh, company in the fintech domain. Uh, later, uh, Trade Air, the company that she, she started, merged into a larger company. And Capitalist right now is on its third year of uh, inception and has uh, already raised uh, $65 million. And Elite chose to speak about uh, the ego trap, the entrepreneur's ego trap. Elite, thank you so much for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ayala. Um, I just wanted to encourage everyone that's on the call to put on their uh, Zoom video as we're doing this thing in, in Zoom and not seeing people face to face. I'm sure you can appreciate the difficulty and challenges of uh, listening to a conference or a, um, a lecture uh, at this uh, time of uh, at this time in general, this time of the day. So I do encourage you to put on your video and let us see you so that it, it feels um, more like a community, which is what ILI is driving for in the past few years um, in this innovation. Um, I have to say that I'm not sure this is possible because the format that we used um, is different. I'm not sure oh. we can see them, but yeah, uh, it's indeed uh, disabled. But we are in touch with the, with the participants through their questions. So if anybody wants to write anything over chat or over Q&A, we'll relate to those. Okay, great. So thanks for the introduction. Um, and I will share with you um, my deck. I hope it's uh, going to be visible to everyone. Um, So I um, wanted to, to talk to you guys about ego, and I think that, you know, when I thought about what should interest um, some other entrepreneurs, um, usually younger and in the beginning of their path, um, I was thinking about something that's a bit more sensitive than the usual stuff that we hear all the time of how to raise money and how to build the right team and the regular stuff. So I was looking for something different. Um, most people who know me, um, you know, understand the, I, I always like to touch on stuff that is not on the trivial uh, uh, path. So um, thinking about ego, I think is, uh, you know, as sensitive as, uh, as we all are facing it and not just in our work environment, but everywhere else. And I think that in Israel, um, and some of you might not agree, but um, it's, it's even a bigger problem. Um, so, you know, if we're thinking about ego, and when Ayala was introducing me, it was uh, even more um, uh, apparent, um, you know, one is really looking at his um, successes. Um, and in our, in our world, we usually look at it um, from a different angle. So what is ego when we're thinking about it is, you know, what we're facing each day when our coworkers are arguing and yelling and trying to make their point, not uh, really focusing on the matter at hand, but focusing on voicing their um, ideas and voicing their thoughts. Um, you know, it's difficult and apparent when there's no real teamwork and every person works for himself. And the feedback that you get when you're presenting something really comes after, you know, a few days and not while you were looking for it. 
Um, I'm sure there are other ways to that you all experience um, in your career and in your um, school environment even where you're facing egos and they come to different uh, places. I wanted to share with you one of my biggest, uh, <laughs> I would say, or most memorable story. Um, when I was working at Triana, um, I was head of business development. And as head of business development, I was focused on uh, building partnerships and working with the ecosystem to increase the value of the company and the sales of the company. And we had a sales organization and the sales organization was purely focused on direct sales to banks and hedge funds. Um, and I was working with partners and third party providers and anybody else basically that is not considered a direct customer. And as you might imagine, like in every other startup, there's sometimes a fine line between sales and business development. And usually, you know, it's easy enough to make the decision what's what for the best and for the value and for the uh, objective of the company. Um, but sometimes it's difficult. And so there's a lot of friction uh, between the two entities. Um, happens to be that in the management team, we were the only two women um, in the management team. One was the head of sales and I was the other, the head of business development. And happens to be that um, the head of sales used to share her office with her entire sales team. And I had my own office um, with um, my team was sitting with the operations people and the QA people because um, I liked them knowing and understanding the product really well in an open space. Um, and one day I come into the office and the CEO tells me that the head of sales wants to take my office uh, because she cannot sit with her team any longer. The team is bigger and she needs to have one-on-ones with them and she needs to have uh, my office, which was by coincidence located exactly near the open space of the entire sales team. And I went berserk. What is that? Who's taking my office? I was very comfortable there. And I let my ego um, get the better of me and basically um, didn't think about what's the best for the company. Um, is there another office I can sit in, which might even be better? Um, nothing. I couldn't see anything. I was just immediately, why is someone taking something that is mine? Um, why is it happening now? And what's the hidden agenda that's around this? And this was a wrong, very wrong uh, thought to have. Um, and happens to be that after this very um, emotional and unmanageable uh, uh, scenario, I went um, to a meeting, which I had planned already two weeks ahead of time, which was a very important meeting with a third party that was very strategic for the company. The meeting was fantastic. And after the meeting, I immediately grabbed my head and said, you know, this couldn't, you know, I, I, I couldn't be, it couldn't be that I really, really went berserk like that around something so small and so, something so um, not meaningful. So basically by sharing this story with you, I hope that I was able to give you some sense of, um, um, feeling that I think as part of our being, we are all uh, sometimes letting our ego take the best of us uh, and lead us. And I think, um, I don't know, I alive this um, conference uh, enables other people to share their stories, but um, I would love to, if possible, have someone else share his story or her story if they're willing to. Um, I don't know if it's possible. Is it? <laughs> well, they can do, you can do this uh, over the chat. Oh. If Frat is saying, I think I would go mad as well. <laughs> cool. Okay. So, um, 
if we're thinking what is ego, you know, and identifying the problem. Um, so ego is the Latin word for I, and it's everything that's focused on the I. And basically, uh, ego emote is basically I love you in Latin, which explains it all. And if we're thinking, um, if, if I was to look at what is the pure definition of ego, so it's really the part of the mind that mediates between the conscious and unconscious of where we are and our, um, our achievements and what we're good at into where we think we need to be good at, meaning we're not there yet, but we're grasping ourselves as such. And so it becomes negative when we're focusing on the eye, when basically it influences our thoughts, our motives, our emotions and behaviors. And, you know, I think if you're looking at um, the different times, if you're focusing on the moment and at the issue at hand and what to do now, um, usually you're not gonna let the ego come and interfere because mostly is when you know, our ego is being managed by our fears and when we feel threatened and we feel threatened when we're taking things that have happened in the past or are going to happen in the future and basically putting um, and enabling our fear to guide us. So, you know, if the head of sales is taking my office, what does it mean that I'm not worth as her and she can sit in my office and Basically, I'm letting my fear drive my decision into, but if I'm confident that I'm great and you know the deals that I'm doing and the stuff that I'm creating and my work and execution is amazing and who cares where do I sit? So, you know, it lets you feel a lot better, be a lot happier um, and obviously be more successful because you're less focused on stuff that's really not important. Um, and as managers, we have to think about the company's interests. We have to think about the project that's ahead of us and what's best for the project and what's best for the bottom line. What is the deal that needs to come in now? And does it matter if I find it or if I help somebody else find it? It doesn't matter. It's what's best for the company and for the overall value and the creation and the success. So if we're thinking about what is ego, but really, <coughs> um, is it negative or positive? And, you know, one can say that proud, pride, uh, and when we're proud of our work and our achievements, that's a good thing. Because you're standing and you're working in front of a market, you're confident to lead, and you need this confidence. Um, you need this confidence to teach your employees and to, to teach your coworkers because there's always stuff that you know and they don't and also learn. Um, it helps you guide and build things and the passion to create. Um, and it entices you to be interested in learning, in learning from others and doing it for the best of the objective. But as a manager, you can also use it as a negative um, my example or other things. So when every time we join a management call, and I'm sure you all have participated in one type or other, um, your employees are captive audience. They're listening to you, whether they like it or not. You're paying their salary. They have to listen. You have the power over the direction of the discussion. And if you take advantage of that, it's basically becoming a negative thing. Um, if you're going into a management team and you're asking everybody to provide their thoughts about what's the objective of next year, and then at the end of each one giving his thought, you're basically ignoring that completely and describing what you think should be the objectives of next year, then there's no point. And basically the audience is captive and the power of your pushing your power um, and making people understand that this is, that their, their thought and their um, ideas don't really matter. So if we're looking at uh, Albert Einstein, who said more the knowledge, less the ego, lesser the knowledge, more the ego, it's exactly that. I think it's the strongest. And at least for me, I always remember this uh, statement. Um, so one can deal with ego um, 
and one can deal with other people's ego. And I want to touch on both things separately and try to give you some tools on how to basically position yourself um, so that you can deal with your own ego. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And how to deal with other people's ego, which comes in very different uh, shapes and forms. And we'll touch upon that. So how do we deal with our own ego? Um, usually, um, you know, there's a place to basically be open. And, you know, that's what I was trying to do in the beginning of this discussion. I was trying to show you how um, I was open enough to share with you an ego story where I was basically um, using my strength and uh, place in the company and, and putting my ego in the negative form. Um, and that puts us in a grateful situation where we're thanking to the position that we are, we're thanking to, and we're grateful for what we've achieved and where we are. Um, a piece of advice is where usually we're very thankful for actions. So we'll thank people for the work that they did and we'll thank people for coming to a meeting and we'll thank them for preparing the document and the presentation. But how many times are we thankful for people for just being there, for just being themselves, being uh, the positive selves that they are, or even being the negative selves that they are, which helps um, brainstorming and other discussions. And I think if you are uh, empathic enough in discussions and with your team and grateful enough, um, it lets you and enables you to listen more. And I'll take you through some of the examples to uh, explain these. So where does it meet us in startups usually? So if I'm thinking about three areas in a startup life where there's the initial steps where you start developing your product, um, looking for the market uh, fit, uh, looking for the, for, for the audience, for the ecosystem. Um, the second one is when you're raising money for that. Um, and then, you know, the execution side where is just a messy middle where you're executing and trying to build it into a bigger and bigger and bigger company. So in the initial steps, we probably all saw the CEO or the founders that are falling in love with their own product. And it's usually that, you know, you come into a, um, a meeting with, a, with founders who have just started and they're talking about their ideas with so much passion and so much excitement and um, you're trying to understand and trying to uh, give them feedback, but they're very much pushing uh, back and not really listening because they're so in love with their own product. And, and that's a typical um, you know, ego issue where you're so in love with your own product that you're not listening. And at the beginning it's to advisors um, to potential uh, fundraising uh, investors. And later on, it's to your customers. And basically, I think that it's so, so important to make sure that you are not too much in love with your own product. Um, forget about the fact that sometimes you need to run through a few pivots. Um, but even if not, it's so important to basically be able to listen and build your products and your company um, with the feedback and with the market as your partners. Um, so <clears throat> initial, in the initial step, the ego can start hurting, but if you're grateful and if you have the empathy, you'll be a better listener and you'll appreciate what you've done and where you are at this point to be able to continue and listen to others and take their feedback into improving your existing and current point. Um, the next one is identifying your weaknesses to build the right team. Usually uh, people take friends and people that they feel really, really um, good with. And we all feel really good with people that are always telling us how smart we are and how great we are but you know, they're not really adding value. If somebody is thinking exactly like I do and has the same type of ideas, then you know, it's not adding and 
contributing to the, the end result. Um, so, you know, bringing in people that think differently, bringing in people that, you know, um, feel the void of things that we're not great at um, is the right thing. Um, getting people that are stronger than us, and I can't emphasize that enough, um, is, you know, a very important step, um, both to the company and to the success of the company, and also to our growth and to our ego. Because if we can come to work every day and learn from our coworkers, um, that's the best uh, scenario in mind. Um, so again, if you're grateful enough to what you have achieved and where you are, you can be as grateful and even more to people that work with you that together, um, you know, help your weaknesses become strengths of the company. Around the area of raising money, choosing your partners. Um, I know that raising money is a difficult and challenging uh, task, but at the end of the day, and again, I can't stress it enough, um, you as entrepreneurs are picking your investors just like they are picking you. And if you don't come with that mindset, it's going to hunt you later on. Um, you need to be able to not only look for the cash, but also look for the right partners that stand behind it because they're going to be crucial for you at the rest of the, of the ride, basically. Every decision you have and every step of the way because the challenging times are where you need your partners by your side, just like your friends. Um, and the same thing goes for setting the right process in place with the investors. You're gonna meet them continuously, investors, and that's a separate presentation, <laughs> uh, always uh, think differently and see things from a different uh, uh, angle. They uh, see a lot of companies where you are focused on one. And if you're not grateful and uh, show empathy to their beliefs and thoughts and to their processes and to their objectives and to what counts for them, um, you're gonna have issues because they're not gonna do that to um, every company that they manage. And so it's very important to make sure that you set the right processes in place with the investors um, and not have ego come in the way. Um, again, if you're grateful enough to what you have achieved, then you're open enough to understand what's important to them and how best to work together. Um, and then the same goes to the market and the clients and their feedback that we've already touched upon. So that's how we deal with our own ego. And when we're thinking about how do we deal with our team and our bosses, it's a bit more tricky because it captures feedback from us that sometimes we're not prepared for. So if, what, what are the types of ego that we might come across? If you see the three um, cups, um, one person can see that as I'm half full uh, the other person automatically sees that as um, half empty. And then the third one just sees that as this is just piece or junk. And it's just how we're built. Everybody thinks about everything differently and reacts differently. So we have the, neg the neglector where they're always negative um, and negative to everything. And in this scenario, they might be great people uh, and very smart and have a really um, good input after, you know, they get all the negativity across. Um, and I guess from my experience, this ego issue is really um, needs to be managed. Otherwise, it can become toxic, uh, but it could be managed very uh, easily if you're identifying it and having discussion with people and continuously showing them the positive side on things and you know joking with that. Um, sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't, but you know it's it's important to make sure that it's not toxic into other team members. The skeptic side is where professionals um, are always skeptic. Um, and it's basically everything becomes 
a skepticism and a joke and they have seen everything already and nothing surprises them. And again, if it's managed, it's okay. Um, but if it's becoming toxic, it's a problem. Um, the pilot is the kind of person that lets you lead the team from the inside, understand exactly who needs to do what and manages it in a very uh, uh, cohesive uh, role. It's their nature. They love the teamwork and they love everybody working together towards the, the correct uh, goal. Uh, the sufferer always thinks that things are very difficult. He could be a very good manager and still be a pilot, or, but uh, a pilot, sorry, but uh, uh, still um, initially identifies how complicated and how difficult everything is and kind of sometimes take, uh, take the air out of the, uh, the balloon even before you start. So again, if you are understand that someone's ego is uh, that type and he always complains, um, just manage it correctly. Just understand and ensure that uh, in front of the team that, you know, you're, sh you're sure he's going to, you know, so-and-so will think that it's going to be um, a rocket science, but we really want to do it in two weeks. And so let's figure out the right way. And by doing that, you're managing the sufferer and you're basically creating and putting him to be the pilot. Um, the silent warriors that... Um, <clears throat> this type does their job without having everyone's attention. They're really not a team player, but they could be uh, um, very, uh, um, very good. Um, they, uh, they have double the efficiency because they're working really, really fast, uh, but they're not really a team player. And again, if you have people with that type of ego that they need to work by themselves and really um, be successful by themselves so that their name is uh, stuck to the, to the task, then give them the sort of tasks that are carrying that. Um, the neighbor, this is really the guy who's not really engaged and he always misses a lot of stuff. Um, again, if he's important and he has the knowledge and there's the ability to transform him into something else, that's great. If not, um, this ego problem is uh, not always manageable. And then the inventor uh, who likes doing things in his own way um, and not really sharing the common ways of others. Um, and that's again, difficult to manage, but possible to make sure that they understand initially that, you, that it's really important to do it in that way, which is different than the way that they thought uh, and explain why and be able to uh, have a discussion and uh, point out the the, dif the differences and the benefits and, and um, disadvantages of each way and letting them understand. Sometimes it takes longer, but it's worth it because you're um, listening to other people's way and not just uh, the way you thought it's going to work. And last but not least, uh, the precious one, which, you know, if you're really lucky, you have this person in your organization, um, they know their task, they know their timing, they're attentive and they're reliable and basically they're precious. Um, and so we all thrive to be precious and we all want to work with precious people. Um, but it's really our work as managers to bring everybody to be precious. Um, and if <clears throat> we're looking at how to basically help ourselves in a situation when we're dealing with these types of uh, different uh, ego uh, characters. I think the best thing, um, and I touched upon it at the beginning, is really adopt the beginner's mindset or basically being humble and being um, modest and being uh, able to uh, identify empathy um, is really reminding yourself how much you don't know and how much you can learn from everyone. Um, you know, my son is uh, 14 and he's playing uh, in Canada at a school. And the Americans that are, the Canadians, sorry, that are with him in the school are, um, they look very big because they eat different uh, type of food, I think, in Canada. So they're very, very big in size. But, you know, I think that given the um, uh, mentality of us as Israelis, uh, we're a bit more mature uh, as kids. 
And so every day he talks to me and explains to me how much he can learn from them, even though they're really childish. Uh, but he learns from them, um, obviously, English, uh, improving his English and uh, learning from them the hockey game, which is what he's there for. So there's always um, a place, basically, what I'm trying to say is that to learn from everyone, which we really can. So if we remind ourselves that every time when we talk to, when we talk to our support people, when we talk to, um, you know, everybody that works in the company, whether they are direct uh, employees or not, we can always learn from someone from their point of view, from their mindset. And when we are open for that, we're less, um, th there's less potential for the ego to take over ourselves and for our ego to, uh, to be the negative side of it rather than the positive side of it. Um, focusing on the effort and not on the outcome, basically doing the best uh, does matter. And you know, when you're running a company, the results are important and you are measured against the results basically at the end of the day. But if you appreciate the path and if you appreciate people's efforts, um, you know, they might not be at the right place and having the right role. Um, and so fix it. It's your job as a manager to make sure that people are at the right role. Um, and when they're doing their best, it's good enough. And basically, if we continuously um, remind ourselves that the outcome is not always the most important thing, um, it helps us manage our ego. When we choose purpose over passion, because passion can run out very quickly and purpose continues and helps us uh, basically uh, um, get more control into the right direction. Um, killing our pride before we lose our head. Um, not telling ourselves the story. Basically, there's no one moment that creates a company. It comprises of many others. So it's okay to make mistakes for us and for our employees. And there's, you know, not one thing that kills everything, just like there's not one thing that um, creates a company. If we learn to manage ourselves and others, um, which is, I think, a very important thing to, to make sure that we're focused on, um, basically, it's not enough to have a smart idea. We have to be able to manage and execute on that. Um, and, you know, we see a lot of companies that have a great idea, but it's just a great idea. And if you're not really creating something out of it, then, you know, it's nothing. It's just stays an idea. And they're really the only way to execute and to make something out of it is with a team of people. And a team of people is being managed by a great manager who doesn't let his ego come in the way. Um, the next point is know what matters to you and uh, basically make sure that everything else takes place after or doesn't take place because there's just so much one can focus on. And <clears throat> if you stress and try to do many, many, many things, there's, not, there's no space. And when there's no space, then you can't really have the time to listen and to think and to show empathy because you're just running after your, your tail and there's no ability to really do the right thing. You're just running, running and not focusing on the right things. Um, letting go of control, as we said before, understanding that there's always another way and sometimes it's important to listen to, other, to the other ways. And the most important thing, uh, which I didn't end up telling you in the beginning of my story, is when you find yourself in a hole, stop digging it. Basically, um, when my office was taken away, I, after the meeting, thought about it, understood that I completely flipped and it wasn't the right thing to do. I came back into the office and I had uh, asked the head of sales, which uh, was my coworker, um, to come have coffee with me downstairs. Um, and I did not go back to my manager, to, my, to the CEO of the company where I flipped. I went directly to the head of sales and wanted to have a chat with her and explain to her and understand from her where things I'm coming, are coming from. 
So basically, I didn't want to continue digging the hole. I wanted to stop and make sure that the right outcomes come into place. And what ended up happening is she didn't even know that he had asked for her to move into my office. It was his idea. Um, and uh, we ended up sharing the office <laughs> and being great friends. So, um, you know, the whole story that I made up in my head that she dug this under me and um, was convinced that there's a hidden agenda and everything wasn't even uh, real. So um, stopping the, the digging is important. Um, not being uh, decisive uh, by recognition, um, uh, money, success, titles, leave that behind. It's gonna happen. Um, people are being uh, very motivated by it and it's important. And at the end of the day, even if you look at our Facebook, you know, it tells you what one has achieved and we show uh, only the great things we achieve and we don't show everything else. So just don't get confused by it and continuously remember what uh, and where you are and what you have achieved um, to get there. So the way, not the actual um, end results. Um, we leave our entitlement in the door. Um, don't let paranoia dictates where you're going. Um, I think this is the hardest thing because as an entrepreneur, you're very uh, paranoid about competition, about the market, about <coughs> success and where you want to go. But if you continuously remember that um, you're doing the best that you can, that your team is the best that there is, and that no one can uh, degrade you. Basically, they're degrading themselves. You'll be on the right path. And really, if we're creating this paranoia, we're really creating the, the fears. Our fears themselves are what's creating the problem. So as much as we can to be strong and confident uh, and forgiving when things don't go our way. And at the bottom line, uh, which I think is the most important, is irrespectively how hard you tried of making a good team, oops, sorry for the misspell, um, success is not just yours. It's always a team that's behind you. Um, even if you put them together and if you're making them work really, really hard and making them work really, really efficiently uh, and the, the company achieved everything, um, they are the ones that made your efforts into a reality. And as much as it's the biggest pride of an entrepreneur, it's, um, it really is the, the biggest challenge. It's managing your team, making sure they're happy, making sure you're happy with them, and making sure everything works in harmony. Um, so with that, uh, keeping you to think, um, I don't know if anybody wants to share an ego story um, with us, but I hope it was helpful enough for you um, and gives you a few pointers on how to um, make sure that you're not letting your ego come in the way of success and letting other egos be managed by you. Thank you. Well, Elite, this is absolutely incredible. Thanks. And it's very rare to hear such, uh, you know, uh, openness and, uh, and so much wisdom about uh, our uh, emotions, really, and the way we need to, uh, to relate to our peers and uh, uh, subordinates and uh, very learning. So Hello, uh, if, question? Uh, if, attendees, if attendees would like to speak, they are welcome to uh, go to the bottom and click the raise hand option. And uh, if you raise your hand, I'll give you the permission to speak and we'll, we'll give you the chance to say something. Can we see them as well? Uh, no, it's a bit more complicated then, but uh, let's at least see if anyone wants to talk. Okay, so if anybody wants to talk, you're welcome to to talk, raise your hand and you'll get permission. And while you're thinking, you let uh, elite, while we're still uh, waiting for people to uh, to come up with questions, can you can you say something about, uh, I mean, you had your own personal journey in this new uh, vertical of fin FinTech. 
um, can you say anything about what's you know what what's the the what it's like what's happening in fintech sure um, so I think that um, in the fintech uh, market usually um, there are different um, uh, areas of focus um, the place that uh, took first uh, focus was uh, most focus basically the biggest focus was was uh, on the retail side, things that are uh, very relevant around payments, around transfers of uh, different money, uh, credit cards, stuff that is really touching the end user, which is you and me. Um, and the market has really um, uh, grown rapidly around that. Um, and that goes with the whole e-commerce changes and everything around that. Um, in the extreme other side of fintech, which is the capital markets, um, I think there are much less, there's much less innovation to date. Um, and there's a huge room, huge, absolutely huge room for, um, for it. Uh, the banks are looking for uh, ways once to, get their existing workflows and existing products to be more efficient and to run on latest technology and latest uh, um, updated uh, um, you know, standards. Um, and obviously there's always room also to compete with the banks, not just to enable them. So there's huge room uh, there. Obviously it's a much tougher uh, areas to get into um, to get the trust of the, the clients and to work with them. But I think it's uh, rapidly progressing. I think that um, it's, you know, I think FinTech is just in the starting points of uh, progressing and there's a huge room and I encourage uh, every technology innovation um, that is there to look into the market and identify places where they can put their um, products into place um, and not be timid from, you know, the difficulty of signing a bank or working with a broker or, or anything like that. Because at the end of the day, these clients are looking for solutions. And so there has to be a way to figure it out if, if, if there is. And uh, of course we have all the digital coins, which is a, a separate world. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole different uh, world by itself. The digital coins, the uh, digital assets, uh, the blockchain that could be or could not be around that. Um, that's like uh, science fiction uh, still in this market. Yep. And uh, the interesting thing is that my bank still they asked me to uh, send them faxes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a big uh, difference between uh, first-tier banks, um, second-tier banks, and then the rest of the world, um, which again, this big gap only presents itself uh, opportunities uh, for technology, for startups, for um, even uh, consulting work. Um, yeah, but there's a huge gap. And right now with the new uh, connections we have with the uh... Um, countries in the Gulf, perhaps uh, we can work out uh, new things together. Some of them have very interesting uh, banking systems. Yeah, I think um, in every country it's a bit, it works a bit different. Um, you know, I don't think that there's any uh, special, uh, um, you know, they're very advanced um, in the Emirates, um, just like uh, many other places. Uh, and I see the opportunities there as I see the opportunities in uh, Russia, Poland, and, you know, the U.S. as well. Um, before we close, um, I don't know if I, I, if I mentioned this before, but uh, there's a question I like to ask uh, our speakers. And this is, if you could uh, select a uh, trait of a power woman, um, you know, become invisible or something. Is there a trait that you would like to, to embrace? Hmm. Um, 
right now definitely become invisible <laughs> so I can go visit my son in Canada which I haven't seen for three months um, which I can be cannot because of COVID um, but um, I don't know it's a tricky question um, a superpower yeah I'd love to have a magic stick not uh, invisibly so have a magic stick where I can uh, very easily enjoy the different worlds um, very easily can create uh, and build uh, products and companies uh, without the challenge of travel, uh, family, and everything around that. <laughs> yes, maybe 26 hours a day instead of 24. Yeah. yeah. Um, a piece of advice to our uh, guests here, listeners in general. Um, well, I, I hope that, you know, um, you're, you've managed to get something out of uh, this past uh, hour. Um, and if, uh, if only um, to make sure that, um, you know, you use your network of people around you in a smart way. Um, you know, if I'm thinking about my deck, uh, I, I'm not sure if I made enough uh, emphasis on that. Um, our team that we work with or that's around us throughout the day um, is basically what we can thrive from. And if we manage to, um, to, to utilize it and to basically take advantage of it and uh, contribute and um, to it as well, um, we, we'll be able to basically optimize on every point of view. And I think that working with the right team and making sure that there's the right harmony and the right um, um, outcome uh, and it's managed correctly is the most important thing that there is. I recently, uh, well, I think this was about a year ago, maybe two years, I read a, uh, about a research that um, uh, looked at the, at the level of trust in various organizations. And one of the things that they uh, um, realized was, was that the, one of the main um, um, reasons uh, startups uh, can work so much faster and are so, mu so, uh, so much more successful than uh, uh, teams in larger companies is a larger level of trust. Yeah. which makes the uh, working in startups so much fun, really, because you don't have to worry about uh, yeah. politics, organizational uh, politics. Right. And uh, when you're interviewing somewhere and they're telling you there's no ego in our company, be sure that there is. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so uh, I wish to thank you very much, uh, Elit, to, uh, for spending uh, your time with us. Great. Thank you. Lovely hosting you. And I want to tell everybody here that if you want to, and you should, if you want to look at this lecture again, uh, once we're uh, over and done with the Global Entrepreneurship Week, we now do three Zoom meetings every day. Um, we'll make sure that uh, all these uh, recorded lectures are available to you and you're very welcome to come and visit them again. So thank you all for being here. And, uh, and good night, everybody. <laughs>